Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. My name is Dr. Paul. I'm here with Dr. Stavros. We're doing another reaction video today. We are going to be talking about procrastination and we're going to comment on the Strive to Fit's channel, her video, How to, Stro How to Stop Procrastinating, which is a super important topic. Dr. Stavros, as you know, this is one of the things we talk about with our students every single day, right? All the time. All so the time. let's... Uh, Let's not waste any time. Let's dive into this video. Now, if you don't know who this is, I will leave the link to her channel and her Instagram below in the comment section. So make sure you visit her, like the video, follow her, subscribe, help her out because she's helping us out. So let's dive in and we will uh, see how this goes and we will uh, pause if we have something to add. Otherwise, uh, hopefully you enjoy. I'm excited. <laughs> My name is Jamie and I'm a second year emergency medicine resident. Today I want to talk to you guys about something that we all suffer from, procrastination. Have you guys ever been in a situation where you're about to start an important task, like studying for an exam, and right when you're about to start, you start to think about all the other things that you'd rather be doing, like cleaning your apartment, hmm. organizing your kitchen. I remember in undergrad in high school, my place would be the cleanest right before an exam season. Procrastination is just running away from our responsibilities. And I would argue that it's a perfectly normal response. Under stress. I love that her way of procrastinating is cleaning. It's actually something that's good to do instead of browsing Facebook and Instagram. I, I love it. <laughs> it was actually my first time. I, I've never heard somebody say that before. Usually it's like one of the movies, obviously pre-pandemic or hanging out, watching Netflix, binging, but she's actually cleaning, which is very nice. It's very comfortable. It'd be like, be like ah, I don't feel like studying I'm gonna go practice my piano scales or my violin or my guitar for three hours instead at least she's productive yeah yeah kudos yeah congrats situations we're hardwired to either fight or flick unfortunately no matter how much we run we eventually have to face the work that we're running away from so let's talk about some tips on how we can fight procrastination and be as productive as we can be tip number one figuring out why you're procrastinating maybe you have too many things to do Sometimes we run away from our responsibilities just because there are just too many things to do. Somehow all the deadlines are bunched together, like all the exams and the essays we have to write are all due around the same time. So in the end, we just end up feeling overwhelmed. And we get stuck at feeling overwhelmed without properly dealing with all the stuff that we have to do. So my advice is breathe and just start. Igno Think one of the, I mean, she, she might get to this, I don't know. I think one of the reasons why people procrastinate it's kind of like a, a it's a loop right you don't do the things you should do and then they stack up and then you have so much like she said that it sort of gets so overwhelming that you're like ah, i'm just pushing it off a little more it's this feedback loop and it's just consistently negative so one of the things that we tell our students to do at least i do um i'm not sure if you have these conversations as much as i do but they're every day um is don't put off the things until tomorrow that you can do today just yeah go to bed with a clear list. Like you shouldn't have a hundred emails. I mean, if you're in business, but if you're in school, don't check your email that often. But you know, if you have, let's say two, two blocks of questions you need to get through, don't go to bed, say, I'll get to it tomorrow. Cause then you have three. And then when you don't do those three, what happens? You start to feel bad about yourself. And then you stop doing what you're supposed to be doing because you feel bad about yourself. And then it stacks up before you know it, your four week plan turns into a six week plan, turns into an eight week plan. So the points you just made of, Oftentimes we procrastinate because we have so much going on. You could probably alleviate that if you just stop procrastinating in the first place. You know, back in college, I, I was a big procrastinator because I was like, I'll do it the next day, next week. And I realized seeing that, you know, I think you don't accomplish anything. You just pretty much yeah. make excuses. So, and then you get upset why you're not doing well in school, why you don't have your high GPA, and not only that, your word should be gold. And if I tell you, hey, I'll get it done and I don't get it done till next week, well, then people get, they, they, don't, they don't depend on you anymore. They, they lose faith. And then you lose faith in yourself. So like you said earlier, get the stuff that needs to be done. And if you're not doing it, figure out why you're not doing it. Is it you just add, you need help, you need guidance, or you're just too lazy, I'll say, lazy to do it and you'll do it later. There's no accountability. Do it now because tomorrow's a new day with new chores and new things that can happen. So... You got to learn your lesson the hard way sometimes. You said two really, really important things there. The first was losing faith in yourself. 
when you when you have things to do and you don't do them, like you said, you don't. So if you have, let's say, a study partner and they never hold their end of the bargain, you lose faith in them. You don't trust them. When you do that with yourself, you might lose faith in yourself. You don't trust yourself. And what that results in, and I don't think a lot of people put this, put two and two together here is when you don't trust yourself, your self-esteem starts to plummet. And when yeah. you have low self-esteem, again, it's just this negative feedback loop of worsening, worsening side effects. The other thing you said was, um, you know, if you don't do these things, you know, they start to add up a little bit. Now, if you clear everything you have to do today, then you might get a little bit, maybe you can get 10% more done. So for example, if you have two blocks to do and you want to review for three hours, maybe you get that all done. And then you're like, you know what, I'm going to do a full hour of Anki today. And then you do that consistently. Those effects, those results, they start to compound in the right direction. So if someone's slacking and you're doing that over the course of four, six, eight weeks, you've done 10% more every day. You've done, I mean, maybe four, five, six weeks extra worth of work. And that's where you go from like your 215 to your 245. Yeah. But like you said, if you let it add up and you don't do it, then you start to compound in the other direction. And then what happens is you're four, five, six weeks behind where you should be. So when you compare yourself to others, you're not even close because if someone did it right and they did, let's say 10% extra, they're not just four, six weeks ahead of you. They're four, six weeks ahead of you, but you're four, six weeks behind them. Double. That's even double. Oof. Keep that in mind. You've got to stay on top of your stuff. Procrastination is the worst thing that you can bring into med school because you just, there's no room for it. You know, I think it's because people don't see the, the results quickly enough, right? So it's of course, like, I'm 100%. hours today. You're not going to see results tomorrow, guys. You'll see the results later on when we take the exam. And we all know that, but we all like, we want to see it now. There is no now. Invest in you. Have faith in you because you're your own person. You put the time in now. There's no way you won't succeed if you put the time in on a daily basis. Guaranteed that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where everyone wants the result today. Instant gratification. but the key is, especially if you're studying for a test, the result comes on exam day, but the results actually come by doing everything right today. So if you right. do everything right today, it starts to, you get momentum into tomorrow and then you get twice the momentum to the next day and the next day. Compounding effects, the snowball effect, you have to just stay on top of it. Let's get back to it because I think we could keep going back and forth. <laughs> So you have a lot of stuff to do and come up with a plan of attack. You can either start with what's due first or what's worth the most. So that's my first tip. Breathe and just start. Just real quick. Um, this goes back to that. Do the one thing that's going to get you the most bang for your buck, the most progress. There's a book called, I think, The One Thing. I haven't read it. A lot of people have. Um, but I put out a video about you know the way to really speed up your goals, get to the, the result faster is by figuring out what are the one to two things every day you can do to get you the most advancement. And then all the other stuff that's not going to get you anything, just get rid of it. That way you can focus on the biggest tasks that give you the biggest results. And I think she just mentioned that. So I think that was something really important to point out. Love it. Tip number two, figuring out why you're procrastinating part two. Maybe you don't know how to start. Sometimes you run away because the task is huge and we don't know how to start. For example, if maybe you want to learn a new language or start preparing for an entrance exam like MCAT or SATs. One way to get around this is by breaking big goals into smaller manageable tasks. For example, you guys know that I'm currently preparing for my board exam step three and studying for a big test like that can be really overwhelming. I try to choose a small number of resources. So I usually choose a question set like UWorld and a reference like a textbook or something. All right, we need to talk about this. You go for it. I'll jump in. Go ahead. Uh, so we talked, we did a video recently where we, we did Dr. Cellini and he didn't even mention any study resources except for his notes. Then we have another doctor here who's an ER physician and she says she limits her resources. I had a, a somewhat of a heated discussion today with someone about this resource overwhelm. You know, yeah. uh, I have this book and this book and this book. How do I use them? I said, why so many books? You don't need all of these resources. They're all giving you the same thing. Resources don't matter. It's the strategy that matters. If yeah. I give you the best book in the world, 
that has literally every answer, but you don't know how to strategize and actually go through it and use it, then it doesn't matter. You're not going to get the results. Man, I know students who have used UWorld and First Aid and just their class notes and scored in the 260 plus range. And I know students have used the exact same tools and more and scored a lot less. It's not about the resources. Minimize the resources. Have your notes, have a solid question bank. We recommend you world. And then yeah. one book is sufficient. Like just so that you can refresh yourself, you know, like master the boards is good for step three. First aid, of course, for step one, step up uh, for step two. You know, there's a few of them, master the boards for step two. Um, what do you think about this? So I, important. I agree with you all across the board. A lot of individuals, because it's easy to say, give me, give me, give me. I'll buy, I'll buy, I'll buy. I'll commit to a couple of resources. Well, what they don't want to commit to is the time allowed, the time that you have to invest it to study. Sure. Because they'll buy two, three books <clears throat> and we'll put the time into it. They'll buy the Q bank, but we'll put the time into it. So let's say my friend scored a 270. Yes, but the difference is your friend's probably studying efficiently and effectively with a ske study with the schedule. For example, this doctor, she studied step three. She worked just like the other doctor we did. She studied from step one, step two, CK, built a discipline, a schedule, a structure, and she's using the same work ethic to then eventually change the resources for the exam. Others aren't even working on that. So imagine now in step one, you had six weeks to study because school gives you all. Step three, they don't give you time off in residency, just like in step two CK. How is she able to do that? How is the other doctor able to do that with a wife, perhaps having kids or not in life? You have to be disciplined and have to be efficient or else my friend, you can give you the best resources, you still fail. I get heated because it's, it's just like you said, it, it, it's a balance of resource and efficiency. Are you able to sacrifice or not? If you're not, just give up. That's it. Give it to somebody else. That's it. Yeah. And the, be the better your strategy, the more efficient you're going to be. So <laughs> if she's, yeah, which is why, you know, when people get to step three, when they get that far, I mean, they've usually figured that out. And, you know, usually that means early on, they had some very good people mentoring them or telling them, you know, how they should actually approach this. Because listen, I always say this, if you want to be above average, don't listen to average people. And what does the average person tell you? You world, first aid, pathoma, uh, but they don't tell you how to use it. An above average person would say, you world, first aid, maybe pathoma, I don't know. Um, that's it for another, another time. But they're going to say, okay, now we've got those tools. This is how you're going to use them. Yep. A hammer in the hands of someone who has no idea what it is is useless. They're going to hurt themselves. A hammer in the hands of the right person is going to build a house, a castle, build everything. So you have to make sure you have a strategy. Without a strategy, all the tools in the world don't matter. But minimizing your tools, like she said, I, this, I, this, is a, this made my day. Just to hear someone who's clearly killing it say it. Love it. Really do. Study materials. I then decide how many questions I want to do each week Strategy. and how much of the reference material I want to cover each week. Strategy. That way I know exactly what I have to do each day and I don't have to waste time trying to figure out what to do. Strategy. One of the benefits efficiency. of having smaller tasks is that it's quantifiable. Yeah. As you check them off, it feels good and you get a sense of accomplishment. And on the flip side, if you don't have a list of smaller things to do, it feels like you're just wandering around aimlessly. And as a result, it's easier to get distracted. If I always, you know, if you talk to efficiency experts, yeah. they'll say, don't have a to-do list, have a don't to-do list. And I think they're trying to get fancy with things. And I think keeping it simple is the best way to approach it. What she's saying right now is exactly what we usually say is have, take bigger tasks. Like you want to score 260 on step one, reverse engineer it. How do we reverse engineer it? What's the goal? What do I need to do? And then break it down into months weeks, days, hours. Therefore, every day, you know hour by hour what you have to do, just like she said, and then write it out. Have a to-do list for every day. Before I go to bed, I always write out, what do I have to do tomorrow? And if I forget, I'll jump out of bed and write it down because I know I can sleep easier knowing tomorrow when I wake up, these are the big things I have to tackle. And then I, I highlight them off and that feels good. And when you do that, you're actually chipping away at the goal, just like she said, I mean, uh, you know, we deal with this so often students don't understand just this foundational efficiency um, tips that will help them avoid procrastination in the first place. You know, a lot of times you and I go back and forth, you send me, you know, suggestions of audio books and podcasts and we do the same. And a lot of times when I'm, when I'm, when I'm let's say, 
I have my downtime and I'm exercising, walking, running around, I'm listening to them. And anytime I have anything I want to jot down, I put on my phone. There's no excuse to not be effective and be successful because we use technology to your advantage. So if you need to put a timer and say, all right, I'm going to take a 10-minute break because I, I can go on and on and on and get back to studying, so be it. There's no excuse. You have to finish everything on a daily basis because it goes back to earlier. If you don't finish your to-do list on a daily basis, it keeps piling up. Then you lose faith in yourself. And like what she said, if you're not checking off those things off your list, you feel like you weren't productive. It's not going to be a positive. It's going to be a negative thing. So it all connects with each other. It really intertwines. It really does. We're working on a passion project like learning a new language, launching a YouTube channel, or starting a blog. Setting a deadline can really help with your consistency. Hmm. For example, for this YouTube channel, I upload every weekend at noon, and I've been doing that for about three years. And having a deadline gives me a time yeah. limit on how much I can spend per video. More often than not, it's better to be done than perfect. Tip number three. I like that. It's better to be done than perfect. Perfectionists never get things done because they never are satisfied. And you and I know people, I'm sure, who I, I can think of a few people off the top of my head who are such perfectionists that they never actually do anything. Yeah. And it leads to nothing. And um, what did she say about a minute ago? There was something she said that, what did she say? We both sort of more often than not, it's better to be done than perfect. There's something she said I really thought was, For this oh, the deadline. Channel. The deadline. So yeah. important. I put out a video a few weeks ago that was, should I, and me and you discussed this too, should I schedule my step one if I'm not yet ready for it? And everyone says, no, I don't feel ready. I don't feel ready. And then mm -hmm. what happens, doc? What happens? It they go on and they study for a year, year and a half. This is the worst thing you could do because you're never going to actually push yourself to achieve anything. Setting a deadline is so important and I love that she brought it up. And, and I mean, that, that's the biggest thing that we, we see all the time. I mean, it's because there's no one's pushing you, right? That deadline is putting, and then the minute people get a deadline, they panic and they go, oh my God, I feel like I can't breathe. Well, that's a good thing because it's pushing you to study and to get there. If there's no deadline, it could be for years. Come on, and guys. we've seen it. Come on. Yeah, we've seen it. We've seen people go for two, three years. I, there's a student recently who we were talking with who'd been studying for step one for four years. Uh, that's, that's a problem. It's too much. That's too just much. too much, too much. It's about three years and eight months too much. Too much. It's better to be done than perfect. Tip number three, prevent your mind from wandering. Phones are incredibly useful. If I get lost, I can get dirty. Where is that? San Francisco. Boom, Jackson Square. Since in an instant. If I get hungry, I can order food right away. I can shop, read, stay in touch with friends easily. And if I'm curious about something, I can look up the answers really quickly. And if you're bored, you can endless scroll through Instagram or Twitter. While phones can be very useful, they can be really distracting. My tip for when you're finally sitting down to do work is to turn off notifications and alerts. You can turn on do not disturb on your phone, or even better, you can leave your phone in a different room or at home if you're studying at the library. If you can't leave your phone because of your job or for personal reasons, you can set it so that only certain people can reach you while you're on do not disturb mode. Keep it I think the reality is no one's gonna put their phone in a different room. We've tried that before, but you can turn off notifications. You can turn it on airplane mode, silent mode. You can turn it on night shifts so that it doesn't ring unless you, let's say your mom, your dad, your best friend, your brother, sister is calling. You can set it so that they will come through, but you know, to turn it over, put it on silent and, and just leave it or even put it in your bag so that only the, if there's an emergency, someone can get a hold of you is the best thing you can possibly do. Otherwise it's just, too, it, I mean, mine is right here. And even I consider myself extremely efficient and I get through a lot of stuff but I also find myself regularly just grabbing my phone and looking at it. I'm like, oh, someone commented, let me check. Even yeah. I catch myself doing the things that I advise against. So I'm gonna put it over here so I can't get to it. You know, just like people who are driving, right? Texting and driving. If people can't stop texting while they drive, and that's life or death, how can we expect people to simply just put it aside? Because there's no punishment if you think about it, right? No one's gonna punish you, Doc, if you take your phone. But that adds up to more and more time wasted, which then the punishment is not getting the score that you want. So you see, they don't see the long term, the long investment. So just put it away. Just put it on the side. Call your family and say, listen, guys, love you. Give me four hours, unless it's an emergency. And then do not disturb, like you said, you put the favorites, you get on through. So that's how bad yeah, you want it. That's all it is. And one of the things that I recommend people do is 
you know, if you are, if you're a student and you're, let's say, living at home, but you're staying at the library or, um, you know, you have a family like a wife or husband or kids or whatever, maybe um, carve out time during the day where they know that you're going to do work and it, you call it like, do not disturb me time. And you say, hey, listen, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., let's say you have kids and they're at school, I'm going to be at the library. Please don't call me unless it's an emergency. And just have the, communicate with the people in your life, whether you have a boyfriend, girlfriend, parents, whatever, so that they know, listen, between 10 and 2, you're just not going to get a hold of her or him. Yeah. And, and setting those boundaries can really help. Then no one will bother you because you've made it clear that you have things you have to get done. So that's well, a really good tip. You're at work, right? I mean, if you're, phys- if, you're, if you're getting employed by someone, let's say you're in a residency, people can't coil unless it's an emergency. Will act as if you're working. You're in your cubicle, kitchen, living room, dining room, wherever you're at, office here. I am at work, working for a better future, working to get a high score, to get into a spot that I want to be happy in life. Think of it this way you won't steer away. That's it. My phone far away from me is something I did for step one and step two studying, and it really helped a lot. Surprise, You'd be surprise. surprised at how many times you instinctively look for your phone to distract yourself from something that you're supposed to be doing. Another way you can prevent your mind from wandering is getting in the right mindset. Something that works for me is having a consistent study workspace. For example, I do most of my studying on this desk when I'm home. And when I study at the library, I usually have a favorite desk or an area I like to study in. Dr. Cellini the, said the exact same thing. That consistent study space, once you get into it, it's like... You know, it's like I have a little puppy and when, when she go, when we go in the car, she goes into a little, a little crate yep. and whether she's hyper or not, when she goes in there, she's sleeping because it's a comfortable space. If you get in the mindset of when I get to my, my, my chair, my desk at my spot in the library, it's that zone where you should just be studying. It'll actually be super effective. Everyone who is killing it says this. It's a common denominator. I mean, it, why not implement it in your daily schedule? See if it works for you too, which it will. So, absolutely. By minimizing having to adjust to a new environment, I can focus better and get more work done. Tip number four, one thing at a time. My last tip is to focus on one task at a time. It's totally okay to have different projects going on at the same time, but while you're working, you should focus on a single task. I don't know if I put out a story or an actual IGTV the other day, but multitasking has been proven time and time again to be less of a productivity tool than more. You can't focus on two things at once. Um, so pe- when people say you need to learn to multitask, so you need to learn to not multitask because it seems like you're doing more, but you're actually doing two things less efficiently and less produ- producti- productively. And ultimately, you're going to get nothing done. So focusing on one task is, honestly, for me, that's been one of the biggest game changers when I realized if I have three things to do, I'm just going to not even touch the other two until one thing is done, no matter how long it takes me. You see now, for those listening out there who know us, when you're studying for step, and let's say in the morning, let's say you're reading in the afternoon, you're doing questions, that's not multitasking because in the morning you're reading, in the afternoon you're doing questions. Yeah. I guarantee people are going to say, well, you said not multitask, so they're going to read for four weeks, and they're going to do questions four weeks later. Either way, just don't crisscross, right? If you're going to spend four hours doing something, do it. Have boundaries and move on from there. That's all it is. Yeah. My multitasking means doing two different things at the same time, not, <laughs> not scheduled different times, just at the same time. So yeah, glad you brought that up. That didn't even cross my mind, but yeah, you're right. Someone to clarify that. for those out there because we'll definitely get a lot of emails and messages on that. You're right. You're right. It's easy to lose interest halfway through and jump into another task, but then you end up with tasks that are not finished. Something that really helps me with this is using the Pomodoro technique. Sure. The idea is simple. The Pomodoro technique introduces a sense of urgency. So rather than feeling like you have unlimited time, you're given 25 minutes to make as much progress on a task as possible. I have a study with me channel that revolves around the Pomodoro technique. So if you're looking for someone to work with to help you get started, you can click over here and check it out. So those are the tips that I have for dealing with. So as you know, we talk about the Pomodoro technique all the time. One of the things that I like about the Pomodoro technique is that oftentimes, like she said, it creates a sense of urgency. But what, what ends up happening is it creates such a set sense of urgency, but also you know that 25 minutes later, you get a break. It's so much easier to get into that flow state where you just zone in 
For me, 99% of the time when I'm struggling to get into the zone, if I set my timer and I say, I got 25 minutes, when that timer goes off, I'm so in the zone, I just shut it off and I keep going. So not only is it good if you really have trouble focusing, but it's really good if you want to get into flow state to sort of, you know, get you into it. And then you can just kind of go from there. You got to, you got into that zone. If you don't get into that zone, you'll lose a lot of time. A lot of, you know, think of it this way, students out there, people out there, even me, you'll spend two, three hours binging a show on Netflix, but you don't put the hour into studying, right? You have to have that feeling of you have to get it done. Just get it done. This is for your future. This isn't just a, a class right. in college, right? This is for you to be a better physician, clinician, either way. Trick yourself into it if you have to. Get it up and running because time is limited. Yeah. Let's see what else she has to say. I think that's it. Let's just see if there's anything else and then we will uh, sign off. Let me know what you guys think and let me know in the comment section what other ways that you guys deal with procrastination. Thank you guys so much for watching. All right. So that was it. So that was really, I was really good. Uh, you know, procrastination, like we said, it's a killer of dreams. One last thing I want to end with here is procrastination is actually a habit. If you really think about it, people who procrastinate regularly, they'll say, oh, I'm a procrastinator. Well, yeah, because you labeled yourself as one. But if you label yourself as someone who never procrastinates, then you can live up to that. It's just like, you know, a lot of people will say, if you want to run a marathon, don't just dabble in running, call yourself a runner. And then when you call yourself a runner, start to run. Cause that's what you are. You, have, you want to sort of embrace what, what it is you want to be. If you want to be a writer, don't just dabble in writing, call yourself a writer and write every day. Same thing here. If you make a habit of not procrastinating, then eventually it'll never even be a thing that ever crosses your mind. I know for me, it's not anymore. I used to be the huge, the biggest slacker procrastinator. I would procrastinate so badly in high school. I'd wait till like 10 PM the day before a final exam, crack a book, realize I didn't know anything and just be like, ah, screw it. I'm just not going to do it. Luckily I got by enough so that I could advance myself, but don't be a procrastinator. Don't label yourself as one because it's a habit. Label yourself as someone who doesn't procrastinate. Develop the habit of not procrastinating, and you'll see that eventually it's not even part of who you are anymore. Yeah. And two things. Uh, one thing is if you are procrastinating, if there's a chore or there's something you have to do, just do it. I mean, you might, that, might not sound, that might sound a little weird, but just physically do it. If I say, hey, listen, John, can you do it for me? And you can physically do it then. Do it, complete it, because if you say I'll do it later, later will never come. And then that comes back to the back step of not being, not taking away the being procrastinate, to not to procrastinate. And number two, ideally, um, well, overall, the whole thing is you can't procrastinate. So we'll go like that because we went back before we said the same thing over and over again. <laughs> yeah, it just gets the ball rolling in the wrong direction. So um, let's end it there. So thank you to, uh, her name is The Strive to Fit. Her name is awesome. Jamie. So go ahead and follow her on Instagram at The Strive to Fit and Twitter. Be sure to check out her uh, YouTube. She's got tons of videos. She's been posting every week for three years. So she's got a ton of stuff. Who knows? Really good video. Jamie, if you see this, reach out to myself and Dr. Stavros at Real Dr. Paul at Real Dr. Stavros on Instagram. We'd love to connect with you and chat a little bit more of this. So, Dr. Stavros, anything else you want to throw in there? No, I just thank you so much. You know, one last thing is all the students that we work with, the reason why I, we call them docs, like we said earlier, right? You call them doctors because they're future doctors. That was actually what I was thinking about and I lost track and I got back on. So, there's a reason why we say, hey, doc, hey, doc, they're medical students but they're in the process, the track of being physicians. Same thing you said earlier. Absolutely, that's a great point, love it. All right, thank you all for stopping by. Don't forget to like this. Don't forget to subscribe, set your notifications so that we can send you alerts every time we release a new video. So thank you all for stopping by. Before you leave, comment with your favorite tip from Jamie in the comment section below. Thank you all for stopping by. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye guys, thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I hope that was a helpful video. We've got a couple more great options. We got one here, we've got one here.